Hello and welcome to episode one of Our Football Podcast. On today's show, we chat Spurs versus Manchester United, Neymar possibly back to Barcelona, the new structure of the Canadian Championship, much, much more. Plus, we sit down with Vice President of FIFA and Canada's own Victor Montagliani. And of course, I'm joined by my good buddy here, Stephen Caldwell. Hello, Christian Jack. How are you? I miss you after missed, yesterday, missed mate. You, mate. It's been like nearly 20, over 24 oh, hours. It's a long time for us, isn't sat it? Sat next to each other talking football. But, but before we get to all of this, we have to say... Yeah. A massive, enormous thank you for the great response for, from everybody since we announced this football, the football podcast. We haven't even had an episode yet and there's been, you know, tremendous, tremendous positive energy. Yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic. We, yeah, reiterate that, KJ. We'd like to thank everybody for the responses, their interaction. That's exactly what we wanted. And yeah, it's been brilliant. So please keep it up, everyone. Send in your questions. We're going to try to get to, you know, to everybody's question and, and to try and talk a little bit about everything that we possibly can to keep this uh, very interactive and, and very much fun. Absolutely. We're going to answer some of those questions later on in the show, but let's get into it. Let's get into the big games. We want to start with our little appetizer, Liverpool at Brighton, a game that we both covered for TSN on Saturday. Liverpool went into the game, obviously four points clear of Manchester City and many people wondering whether yeah. there would be a little bit of a blip. They'd lost back-to-back games. They'd lost that game against Wolves as well. Uh, Brighton, as we've said, many times uh, together lost six of just 29 Premier League games coming into the match it looked like it may have been a little bit of a slip up for them um, but you know in the end I think the assurance and the control of Liverpool was very evident yeah uh, I was one of them KJ I, I thought that this was going to be a bit of a banana skin a really difficult game a game where they had real moments of you know, maybe not uncertainty but but pressure or uh, you know, Brighton pushing them back <laughs> wasn't the case, was it? It was no. complete confidence and domination by Liverpool. I thought they were absolutely magnificent on the day against, you know, what you'd expect. Brighton with the, the 10, 11 men behind the ball, the forwards coming right back to the halfway line, making it very difficult. Um, Klopp's confidence in the pre-match uh, interview, we commented on it at the time uh, and off air and we said that, you know, he looks so assured and this team is playing with just real confidence, just real uh, belief in what they're trying to do and they, they have everything to their game and I thought that Fabinho playing at the back was a bit of genius he understood that the two uh, centre-backs in Van Dijk and Fabinho were going to be playmakers and the width that Robertson and, and Alexander-Arnold provided was, was key to me mm. you know, everything goes through the middle with Liverpool but if they guys aren't out there and wide and in that space, I don't think the, the goals come about and they just kept going and the moment of magic from Salah, really, after that moment, there was there was no doubt it was going to be three points. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned about playmakers. I wrote some numbers down and sometimes passing stats, can you can read whatever you want. And get, I'm, I'm going to get into that a little bit with Jorginho in a minute, but Virgil van Dijk attempted 131 passes in the game <laughs> and completed 118. Incredible. By the way, Fabinho, 94 of 110. That's you know, incredible. incredible passing stats. And they weren't all short passes really no, they were not. Van Dijk tried a lot of diagonals for Binho too so that's not just laying it to your fullback that's actually trying to play it 40-50 yards yeah I want, well let's get into that right now the diagonals because they were a massive part of the game I felt we tried to highlight yeah. a little bit at half time on the game that we were doing uh, Brighton played a very very narrow 4-5-1 um, yep. and, and Gross would be the player actually end up being the one who committed the penalty foul on, on, on Salah but they were extremely narrow Alexander-Arnold and Robertson were a massive part of the attacking prowess for Liverpool during this game and Van Dijk and Fabinho were not shy were they to keep the ball and maybe try and push Brighton out and then ping those diagonal balls across that led to a number of chances they were the playmakers of the game they understood mm. that the forwards were going to drop off from Brighton and, and they were going to be on the ball more than anybody else in the field and your stats tell that KJ but I thought what Liverpool did really well and you know we'll get to Spurs more in a minute and I thought they didn't do it so well today was that when the, the, the tight, the, the bodies were in the middle of the park, they used the width, you know. So when you, you see a, a, an area of the park that's really, really tight, you have to go wide to then come back in because as you go wide, inevitably the defensive team who are trying to play narrow, again, I understand why Chris Hutton set his side up to be narrow. They then spread out that little bit. Then that entry pass comes to, into a Salah or a Firmino yeah. or a Manny. Uh, Shakiri playing really high was, was a key to me as well. And I thought tactically, Klopp was absolutely brilliant in the relentless way that they played. Robertson hugging that touchline, Alexander Arnold on the other side, just that meant that inevitably because of the, 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 the gap in quality between the two sides, there was going to be moments when Liverpool had too much and Salah provided it with this quality. Yeah. So let's talk about Salah. Seven goals now in his last seven Premier League 
fantastic games. Three, the last three have been all penalties, by the way. That was some, some yeah. penalty. Oh. We were watching it and we were just starting to wonder because Button was in goal. Uh, yeah. And you're like, okay, well, maybe he doesn't, you know, well, he, he, and then it was just a thunderbolt. Yeah. So just, well, good luck picking that one out. I uh, know. You said Ryan, you know, if Ryan was in goals, I actually fancy him maybe he's got to get a good this. record from Very Pence. good. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, watch this Button, you know, nobody expects him to save it. And yeah. he's bouncing along the line, wasn't he? Feeling the crossbar and he made himself look <laughs> really big. Stretching his arms was oh, wide as he could. Go, and yeah. we had the you know the the opportunity to watch the tactics cam yes. as we call it where you can see the whole field so we were watching it on that and we could see button really particularly moving there was there was no iso cams for us as we were watching it and you know the pressure was really on Salah yeah. he knew it was going to be a game of very few moments obviously from the penalty spot is a, a big moment you have to put it in the back of the net what a penalty it reminded me of maybe a, a Shearer or a guy who used to play with Graham Alexander yeah, who, great point, yeah. you know just sort of pick their spot and go there and, and, and you know don't care if the keeper wants to go that way just as long as he strike the ball properly and Salah did that button was disappointed because he, he guessed right and he went there full and, and stretched out but it was too good I always love the penalty it takes me back to my Sabutio days as a kid when, <laughs> when the ball hits the back of the net so hard that it can bounce back out yeah, it's, it's a great. tremendous strike like, <laughs> he doesn't know that he just, if there was no net there it would just keep going yeah. and going and going and yeah. probably hit some poor fan behind in the face. But, uh, <laughs> by the way, Salah's got 14 goals in the Premier League now. I've got it in my notebook here because I've watched all of his goals. We've done them. 11 of those 14 goals have been one-touch goals. Yeah. What I mean by that is he hits it and he goes in. Now, when he first came to the Premier League, he was seen as this constructor of play, maybe a, a bit, a few touches that leads to goals. Now, of course, the penalties are going to be one-touch goals. But that's only three of them. I think that speaks to the definition of his role and how different it is this year. And also about how Liverpool play. You mentioned Shakiri, They're getting four of them on the field together. Obviously, Firmino, Mane, Salah, as well as Shakiri. And, and we like that now about this team and what they did in the second half to change that against Manchester City as well. Yeah, we, we've talked about it on air, about the fact that they've sort of changed from this 4-3-3 three, three with, with Salah playing off the right and Manny playing off the left. Firmino is that, you know, quality roaming forward that he is, but they've sort of went towards the 4-2-3-1, haven't they? They, yeah. they want to get Shakiri in the team more and they want to get Salah central. Uh, that's where he does his best work. One touch finishes, not surprising to me. All the work, the quality comes from different areas. Usually they get down the sides. I love how they get into wide areas. Robertson, for me, has been the unsung hero of the Premier League mm-hmm. this season. He's been absolutely magnificent. Far and away the best left back in the Premier League. And now, in my opinion, should be talked about as one of the best left backs in the world. And yeah, I agree. Of course, he needs to show and that I can, consistency. I'll say that because yeah. I'll say it not in a Scottish uh, accent. I know. So then people might add a little <laughs> well, bit more quality yeah, to that. <laughs> yeah, but it just, he's been brilliant and he provides that with. And as it comes across, the focal point is Salah. Now, that's genius from Klopp because he's recognised that to ask Firmino to always be that focal point in the yeah. box takes away from some of the qualities of his game. So he's found a way, allowing Roberto Firmino to to have that, uh, you know, that license to roam around, to to press people, to get on the ball, to even drop into midfield to, to play make a little bit, knowing that Salah is going to be in, in the middle more often than not. And I think it's been the evolution of the team. I think it's really improved them and helped them this season. And again, it's it's a way to find Shakiri also more minutes as in the eleven. I agree. A lot of credit for Klopp. I'll be honest, I think we were both on the same page. We often are. We're quite sceptical about the Shakiri signing. Yeah. You know, when he, when the, I mean, 13 million pounds is nothing in this area. You know, it's like, okay. Yeah. But it was always one of those, well, is he going to play? Like, okay, he might be one of those League Cup players or FA Cup players who'll get minimal minutes in the Premier League every now and again to spare one of the front three. But to get them all on the field together, uh, uh, every credit. Now, I've been around you a long time. I know you'll have a 1 0. You, yeah. you love one nil, right? I got some notes here. By the way, Jamie Carragher wrote something earlier this year on the Telegraph, and I thought this was really interesting for this time. He said, in the past under Jurgen Klopp, too many games were like basketball matches. Many examples of exciting football, but not winning football. Yeah. And now we have many examples of real winning football because, again, another one nil. Sir Alex Ferguson would always say a hallmark of champions is a one nil win. It shows you are a unit. It means that you're a championship team and, and you can be determined and play out. Look, we know that in the lower league, in the lower areas of the Premier League, some teams are going to win more, more than one nil, uh, have more one nil wins than top teams just because top teams are now blowing them out. So we're not saying that you have to have more one nils than everybody else in the yeah. Premier League. By the way, this is Liverpool's fourth one nil season twice against Brighton Leicester had seven of them uh, when they won the Premier League I remember Chelsea had five but two very big one nils in that in, in, during that run I think they had three in a row Man City had three last year but two against Chelsea my point being when you win games one nil and I want you to go back as a player now yeah. when you score that goal when you've got that defensive solidity as a unit when you get that goal it must be an amazing feeling to know we're just going to win today 
Yeah, and it's also a scary feeling <laughs> because you never want to be that confident in right. a football match. But uh, ironically, I felt that most when I was at Birmingham under right. Chris Hutton because of the, the style of play. And I think hey, we've talked about uh, Duffy and, and, and Dunk at the back there and how they're protected. And yeah. uh, Liverpool are <laughs> a flamboyant version of that, aren't they? You know, the minute they score a goal, we're like, who's going to score a goal against them? The goalkeeper's magnificent. He's always on the top of his game. He's always coming for crosses, positive, on the edge of his area. They've got the most dominant centre half in world football in Virgil van Dijk. Mm-hmm. He's playing out of his skin. He's absolutely magnificent. Positionally, on the ball, uh, physically, we could go on and on. Uh, his partner at different times has changed because of injuries, but uh, they've really created this this solidity to the back line that we didn't see in previous years. We saw an exciting bunch of players and then we saw a, a, a vulnerability to them. It's gone, absolutely gone. And so the 1-0s are, are, are vital because you can't go through a 38-league game season and win every game of swashbuckling football, even with Manny and Salah and Firmino and Shakiri and Sturridge and mm-hmm. Origi, and I could go on and on. Yeah. You've got so much quality in the forward areas just can't do it. There's going to be games like Saturday when you're playing against Brighton, you miss a chance or two and you need to kind of grind it out in, in their very flamboyant style, like I say again. And, and they've did that and, and they'll continue to do that and it's a hallmark of champions. You just see it all the time. The Fergie side had that. I think it was the year they beat Newcastle where uh, Cantona scored the late goal at St. James's right. Park and their defence was so solid that year but they were missing a little bit of creativity so they they had to be that kind of team. This team have both. Like, we need to recognise what we're watching yeah. here. We're watching Manchester City and Liverpool playing at the absolute top of world football together in the same season. Let's appreciate that. This is like watching Federer and Nadal for a decade at mm-hmm. tennis. Uh, you know, this is a, a battle of two magnificent football teams with, with just about everything to their game and uh, the, the the guys who are trying to keep up not doing a great job the Chelsea's the, the Spurs the Manchester United the Arsenal's are pretty good teams and they're, they're going to fall 10, 15, 20 points behind because they just can't keep up the consistency of these two Yeah, it's like watching two record-breaking marathon runners at certain mile points just out just you know out running and yeah. stretching away and leaving the gap behind for fantastic in fact simon glee friend of the show who's, who's a outstanding statistical mind had a great article on bbc recently where i think it was just this week where he said statistically right now we're looking at you know first second third fourth record points after so many years uh, so many state uh, so many games in the premier league and we'll continue to do that finally before we move on Virgil van Dijk. I was talking to Frank de Boer last week about, yeah. about Virgil van Dijk and he said something to me. He said, trust me, when you play at that level, when you get to that point, when you are just playing, your, your confidence is bigger than a room. You just feel it. You can <laughs> yeah. just feel everywhere you go and everything you're doing right. And I yeah. think as a player, you, I'm sure you can just, you've got to those moments in your career. I'm not saying you were Virgil van Dijk, but you- <laughs> Nowhere near it, mate. Come on, let's mate. be honest. Come on. You've had moments in your career when you've yeah. gone out there at a level when you know you're just on the cloud. This is easy at the moment. You've had runs like that. Yeah, well, one of my best friends in football, a guy called Stuart Malcolm, and best friends in life, to be honest. Right. We've known each other since we were about 13. Says it best. He said, I, I always used to phone him after the game. How did you play, big man? He said, The ball was like a beach ball. And that's the feeling. That's <laughs> yeah. what you get with Not Darren Bent's like, beach ball. No. <laughs> you know, when you're playing in one of the games and you, you've got that size five ball, you see it like a beach ball. You see it like a Swiss ball. It's so big. And, right. and it's just your head's a magnet to that ball. And, and that guy's just a magnet. The ball just comes to him every single time. And that's to do with positional play, of course. And it's to do with his absolute physical ability and the fact that. Every time he goes up in the air, you don't think he's going to lose the ball. Now, we've saw players in the past that have that defensive ability, but to couple that with his ability to to, to step forward into the play, right and left foot. In, in Scotland, he used to score pile drivers from 25 yards. We've not even really seen that not yet. at Liverpool yet. Yeah. And that, that's another part of his game. He used to take free kicks as well. He doesn't get a chance to take free kicks at Liverpool. The, the guy's got so much to his game and... A player like Frank De Boer tells you how good he is. Mm. <laughs> the, the, the player that he was uh, throughout his career, and he knows him pretty well, obviously being the same Dutch nationality, just tells you what level he's at and how he's playing. I, I think he's got more to come as well because y- you can see that confidence growing, can't you? This this guy's a true leader and he, he, he's going to wear that armband in, in for the next 
however many years, and I don't see Liverpool ever losing that guy. He's going to retire at Liverpool. Magnificent signing, and, and your point there about not losing the ball. We were watching him very closely again on Saturday. When he goes up to head the ball, 95% of the time his header finds a, a teammate in a good yeah. position as well. So he sees the play before it happens, and then he heads it. A lot of defenders just say, I've got to win yeah. this ball. I've just got to win the ball, and, and no matter where it bounces, it doesn't matter after that. Yeah. He glides the ball into another possession of, and starts another attack well, with his head. I, I had a world-class coach and Tommy Craig, Scottish international at Newcastle, and uh, he challenged us when we were 17 years old. Don't just go up and head it forward as far as you can. Nod it down to your fullbacks, nod it into positions mm. safely where, where people can control it and can start attacks. And it, it always stayed with me. Of course, I had managers at times in my career that didn't want that. They want it to go 30, 40 yards into the distance. So again, credit to Jurgen Klopp for asking his side to play. We, we know that. We can see that from, from the way they go about playing the game of football. But that is quality and that takes vision as well. Uh, again, I'm reiterating the same point, but I just love his positional play because you can't do things like that if you're not aware of where everybody is in the field next to you and and Van Dyke has an unbelievable sixth sense when it comes to that he knows where everybody is he sees scans the game knows the pictures like a, a Maradona or a Messi and, yeah. and to have that in a centre half is very very special Talking of 1-0s let's go to Wembley and uh, Manchester United won at Tottenham for the first time since March 2012 <laughs> Ole yeah. Gunnar Solskjaer is just breaking all the records oh, first yeah. manager of Manchester United history to win six games although I'm not quite sure I know I'm going to go there. I'm not quite sure how many other managers had <laughs> had Cardiff, Huddersfield, Bournemouth, Newcastle, and Reading to start your yeah. your your Premier League. Um, but I bring that up because I was a skeptic before today. Uh, five games, okay. Everyone's saying give Ole Gunnar Solskjaer the keys to the house, the car, the driveway, the, the shed. Give him everything. I'm like, hang on a minute. Like, yeah. we played nobody. But today, and they wrote the look. We're going to get into this today. I think the way he set them up, for, particularly for the first 45 minutes with Rashford and Martial as split strikers wide, counter-attack, pace, yeah. no position for your mate Lukaku um, from the start. Yeah, thankfully. Uh, and I thought that he got that right. Now, yeah. maybe, okay, we'll get to De Gea and the road look in the second half, but I want to talk about that first because I think United started a game really well, which they haven't done in the past. Yeah. Mourinho, that was a big Achilles heel for them this season. And tactically, I think he found a way to try and exploit Spurs, who obviously like the width and, and, and they play with a diamond as well, with their wingbacks getting higher. And in the end, it worked for them on the goal as well. So we know that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was brought in to bring back Manchester United football, to bring back that goodwill, that right. confidence, all the things that, that, that we expected that he brought from day one, the way that he talks, he, he knows the football club inside out. What we didn't think was that they were bringing in a, a tactical mind because we just hadn't seen enough of that at, at Mulder. We didn't see any of that at Cardiff, really, obviously, with a very difficult situation with Cardiff in the Premier League. But what we saw today or on Sunday was an out, outstanding performance mm. by a team tactically. I thought he got it spot on. That was a mark of genius to play. Martial and Rashford just inside the fullbacks, outside the central defenders. I've seen it done before. It's brave, it's bold. Lingard plays as a false nine. He drops back on to Harry Winks when he needs to and it can be a bit of that focal point as a centre forward at other times as well. It means that on transition, as the fullbacks of, of Tottenham Hotspur go really high, there's going to be space down the channels against two centre-halves who are wonderful in the ball for Tongan and Alderweireld, but don't really have the legs to stay with Martial and, and Rashford. And it proved to be the point. They waited on their opportunity Pogba had a slow start, in my opinion. I don't think he had a great 40 minutes. No. And then the moment of genius, great ball, great finish. And, and I thought tactically it was it was brilliant from Solskjaer. And I have to give him credit for that because I didn't think he had that performance in him. And against a tactical mind and Pochettino, a guy that we love and, and respect in that regards, it was, it was pretty impressive. Um, from a personal point of view, as soon as he, he started doing that, I'm making notes watching the game and I knew we were doing this show, t um, after the game. I started, I was like, yes, I was, I was like, because I'm like, I can talk to Stevie and get our listeners to hear his Roberto Martinez story. So <laughs> the background on this is that yeah. we did the World Cup together. We did every game. Yeah. And one of our, one of my favorite games of 2018, in fact, of recent World Cup history, and I was watching it again recently on the treadmill was Brazil, Belgium because of the way that it was back and forth, but, tactically, and we were lucky enough to have the tactics yeah. cam during that game, tactically he had Lukaku out wide with De Bruyne as that Lingard figure today. Yeah. And I remember you telling me a story during that time when Roberto Martinez said to you, we're not going to play with a striker. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we came in on the Monday morning and uh, we were playing Chelsea at Stamford Bridge on the Saturday. 
and he pulled us in and Roberto was always very advanced ta- tactically. You know, we expected training wasn't bog standard stuff. It was actually to prepare for the Saturday. Every yeah. session was, was weird towards what we, what we were going to do. And he pulled us in and he said, yes, we're going to play without a striker on Saturday. We're going to play with just two white guys. And my brother, Gary, was obviously at the club with me at the time. We looked at each other, Ben Watson, at our little group and thought, he's finally gone crazy. We're <laughs> going to play without a striker yeah. at Stamford Bridge. And it was genius. We played really well. We lost the game 1-0 again. This is the thing about quality and they had more than us. But the number of times we played Charles, Charles and Zogby on the left and uh, Hugo Rodiega on the right. right. And the number of times the outlet ball was to that wide area where the fullbacks were extremely high and they moved into advanced positions because they had line share of possession. And we got 1v1 situations against a quality player like John Terry, but it's not physically or agile as, as a lot of centre halves and we got opportunities to run at them and it was the same kind of thing today You sometimes a team's strength can be their weakness a strength of Spurs is uh, Davies on the left or Rose and uh, Trippier, Trippier yeah. or Aurier normally Trippier on the right and that is their strength they get in wide areas Trippier was magnificent today putting some great mm-hmm. balls but what it leaves is space down the side so you know when you get the ball you win the ball back that's your outlet ball and you train all week for that mm-hmm. one moment decides a match yes David De Gea was outstanding in the second half but that moment was critical and it was because of the tactical work during the week. Now, I thought Winks played well, but I want to caveat that by saying I thought if Dyer was there, I yeah. thought that the, he may have dropped deeper and maybe stretched it in because we've watched a lot of Spurs games tactically on the tactics camp yeah. where that can work. Well, you know what modern day formations are like, they're forever interchanging where in possession, when you've got your fullbacks higher, Dyer will drop and it will effectively yeah. be a three in the transition. Now the transition led to the goal eight seconds before United scored, they didn't have the ball. And okay, it was the aforementioned Trippi who played the pass in, but as soon as you give the ball away, you've got Davies at one end, yeah. who's really high, and then you've left the centre back of Vatonga and isolated. So I, I just felt that maybe that was where they lacked something there with Dyer. Uh, let me know what you think of that but also do you think with the modern day fullback playing as high as that do you think we're going to see more and more teams around the world playing with that or is it maybe a little bit too radical no I I think we are going to see it more and more obviously defensively Spurs will find a way to combat that you're right KJ it might be Dyer or whoever dropping a little bit deeper allowing the centre halves to mark maybe more on the outside maybe that will start happening with, with the guy one of them coming inside. So, so in the, the far side, uh, the weak side, you could say maybe he marks on the outside and the other side he comes inside. So it's more difficult or easier to defend that sort of straighter channel ball than it is to, to go for that diagonal mm-hmm. ball. Um, I'm not suggesting for a minute that I'm a genius and I foresaw the goal coming, but what I did see was a horrible situation for Trippi because of the defensive shape of Manchester United. And I, I, I panicked at the time for him. I thought because Martial was quite deep, was yeah. as well. He was actually in front of Trippier. And he, he was, was on the left, ball. Left forward. He looked to go into to, to Kane or Son. He looked to go in centrally. There was no space. There was just red shirts there. And instead of forcing it, I thought it should have turned out, came out, went the other side through Alderweireld, then Vertonghen, yeah. and then round like that. But he did try to force that ball. Lingard was really smart. He broke it down. And then within one minute before the danger could be realised, you know, it was in the back of their net or within eight seconds, not one minute. Uh, but that, that was, um, an important part of it. The, the, the solidity of the midfield shape that denied that pass into an area. So it was a, a mistake from Trippier, but yeah. I love Winks. I really love him. He's mm. learning the game. I love how he, he drives forward with the ball. I think that he's positive. He plays forward passes. I think he's going to develop into an outstanding player. I think he might develop into an even better player than Eric Dyer, but I don't think he's better than Eric Dyer at the moment right. just because of that experience, that know-how of He's of got playing. more vision, hasn't he? But yes. defensively, I think Dyer has a little I bit more about him. he's got more legs as well, yeah, Katie, does, and yeah. I think as he learns how to play that deep position, he'll really become a wonderful player. But at the moment... His exuberance is almost his Achilles heel. I, I, I don't see Pochettino taking that away, but I think in time, as Harry Winks improves as a Premier League player and, and as a you know Champions League player, he's going to learn when he drives forward and, and when he senses. You know that was a situation that could have been sent. Trippi was in trouble. Maybe Winks just moves three or four yards back a little bit earlier and he stops the, the, the situation from arising but um, I don't think Pochettino or anybody wants to take that away from his game I think he'll just instinctively learn when to move forward and, and when to be that little bit deeper to protect his central defenders 
Did you have a problem with Larice on the goal? Because I did. Yes, I did. You did. We always have a problem. We have with a problem Larice, with Larice a lot. Yeah, yeah. and and he actually a... turned his back. Did you see this? Yeah. He actually turned his back on the goal uh, on on the player for it was only a split second. Yeah. But when do you? He, so he realizes he's going, and then he runs back to his goal and has a look over his shoulder at the goal away yeah. from the play, and then um, sorry, I interrupt. But in my opinion, yeah. he goes over too far. He ends up marking like the post with his left foot, and it's that small. It's it's a sound like a small thing yeah. but that's why when he actually touches it with his finger he can't touch it with his palm to palm it away because he's far too over on the left hand side I feel like we've seen that from him before as well yeah, haven't we? you know he, he seems to turn his back to the goal at times as well and I just, it's really critical because you see where the ball goes in it, it just goes in inside the post mm. but I think De Gea saves that I agree and I'm not technically um, in a position to talk about goalkeepers. None of us players know anything about goalkeepers. It's funny, I talk to a lot of managers and the minute a goal goes in that they don't like from their goalkeeper, they turn to the goalkeeper and coach and say, how did that happen? You know, and the poor goalkeeper coach just beads of sweat coming down his head because he yeah. has to explain it because we don't really get it, but we're very critical. And, and I was critical of him because I just think his position was right. I think often he's still moving. He's not getting set when the shot's coming in. And I feel it might be a little bit of that as well. And uh, as we're going to talk about the hair saves, his saves are more simple. We expect him to make them, but it's because of his footwork, KJ. It's because of where he gets on the field that the ball's near him. Yes, he saves a lot with his feet, but I'm talking about his footwork to get into the position, particularly yeah. the, the, the Delhi Alley one where he's, he's there and he makes a save at such short distance. I think a lesser goalkeeper is a bit further back there, giving more angle to the goal and it probably goes in the back of the net. Yeah, I agree with you. By the way, Marcus Rashford, that was his 24th Premier League goal in 97 Premier League appearances. Harry Kane, when he was at, his, when he was at the same age, only had three Premier yeah. League goals. So it says a lot about Marcus Rashford already and He's what, and what player, he, he could he? become. And I love, I love seeing him get that opportunity to be the man. Yeah, he's he's the man right now. He's grabbing it, isn't he? Is. he? Yeah. You can see his confidence grow, and he's loving it. He's you know wearing that shirt with pride. This this guy's a future of Manchester United. And yeah. Lukaku, I mean, come on, seventy five million wasted on that guy. He, the game was too quick for him today, mate. Yeah, he couldn't play him at the start. We've all you know when he first came in. Solskjaer Lukaku was moved aside because there's personal reasons and then he's come back and he had the two substitutions today was the day when we thought okay now's the day he's going to start the game and we didn't need much evidence to find no. out why you watch that first 25-35 minutes of the match you can't you can't play him in that, that system can't play him can't play him can't put in the work rate doesn't have the dynamicism to affect the game um, doesn't even hold the ball up that well for a big guy you know you, if you want to go and get a big guy hold the ball up yeah you wouldn't choose him. You can go and get no. a guy for 20 million that That's can right. do it better than him. He scores goals. There's no doubt about it. He can't score the goals for your country and the clubs that he has, but he needs a ball put in a plate for him. And, and back to Rashford, this guy's the future. So why why deny that growing process, especially in a season where, yeah, of course, they've got a chance of getting four from your Manchester United. You're expected to win every single game. But this is a season that he, for me, he should start every single game from now on in. He's ready. And some of his, his footwork's tremendous. He can play off the left or the right. He works hard. He, you know, he's learning the game more as it comes along. And he's a natural finisher. So, uh, get him in there. And I always say it, to be a Manchester United player takes very, very special attributes. And there's some great players that have worn that shirt that are not capable of, mm. of, wearing that shirt right. if you know what I mean yeah 100% and, and they've signed far too many of them yes, over the last decade by yes. the way and yeah. that's why they're struggling because yeah. maybe half that squad are not really capable of wearing that shirt the young lad up top in Marcus Rashford he is capable of wearing that shirt yeah. he owns that shirt and that's because he came through the system and it's back to what they're trying to get back to that youth academy exciting attacking football with academy products yes they need to be good enough but a guy like him is good enough why wait? Just get him in the team, allow him to express himself. Solskjaer's did that. The next manager's job will be to do that even greater. He's going to be a world-class striker. Yeah, it's fascinating to watch that develop and uh, keep an eye on that. There'll be lots of other shows and there's lots of other columns already written, waxing lyrical about how amazing De Gea was. Yeah. So I don't want to get too much into it. All I'll say is, and I'm not a United fan, I'm not a Spurs fan, it doesn't matter. I was just delighted. Whenever I see greatness come back to the fore in any sport, it pleases me. Yeah. Because he's been down for too long. You know, and, and, and there's lots of people arguing. I'm not going to be arguing whether he's the best player in the world at that position. I don't care. Yeah. Okay. All I know is 
that he's, he is one of the best goalkeepers in the world. And by the way, Hugo Lloris is a very good goalie. That for me is, a, is an absolute perfect snapshot of the difference between a genuine world class star goalkeeper and a very good international goalkeeper. That is your difference right there today. And that's for me, it doesn't get discussed enough about. We talk about in the, in the, in the outfield players, how different Messi is to the 10th best player in the world. Well, right there is a genuine world class goalkeeper at, and an average very good goalkeeper so, so that's for me it was what well, I was just delighted to see him back because he did have a very very difficult few months all the way back before the World Cup yeah I, he's had a difficult time we've been vocal about that he, he's looked a little bit down in the dumps he's maybe been part of the, the overall feeling around the football club and of good course point. he had a really disappointing World Cup so it's hard to come back from a World Cup even if it's successful but when it's disappointing it must be even worse you're tired yeah. you're feeling a bit sorry for yourself and he's made some uncharacteristic mistakes but Today was the old De Gea, tremendous performance and truly world-class goalkeepers win you points on their own. They had a, a great day in Peter Schmeichel who, who did that consistently. They won titles because he won games on his own and De Gea did that today again. He was, he was absolutely critical. None of his saves were outstanding to me. I think maybe the, the one where Kane sort of feigned on the right and came back on his left foot and De Gea had to outstretch his right leg to make the save was his best or possibly Aldo Varel's from the corner. But I liked that one from, from Harry Kane. was was really good. But the rest of them you would expect to save. But I'll reiterate my earlier point. He saves them and he makes them look easy because of his ability to move his feet quickly, get in position, get himself set, and then his agility to, to then move and, and, and make the save from there. A brilliant goalkeeper. Delighted for him. They're going to need him to stay if they're going to build because he's very important. And I think he might just do that now. Yeah, and at time of taping, we're not going to really talk about the cane ankle thing because that things might develop later. But I do want to say this. And whether he's injured or not, I want to say this. Since that goal at Villa Park of November the 2nd, 2014, which, by the way, I read the match report today, said lifted the heat off Mauricio Pochettino for the time being. <laughs> That's what it said at the, that time. And I remember doing that game. It was a deflected free kick goal in the 90th minute. Harry Kane runs towards the away fans. And Pochettino said after that game, I may now have to start trusting Harry Kane a little bit more. Well, after yeah. that goal, he has been basically the Harry Kane that we all know since then. He's played 230 games since November the second 2014 169 goals by the way but that's not my point 230 competitive games since then in 1533 days that is a game every six and a half days a game every six and a half days for Harry Kane since November 2014 there's been 51 months since then and he's played games in 50 of them so there's only only one month in July of 2016 where this guy's just not played football incredible yeah. amount not only does that speak to his incredible work rate and, and his fitness but it also just speaks to how much we're used to having him around yeah. you know and, and you know we'll see about his injury but I just thought that was uh, some numbers I wanted to share with our listeners because yeah. it just he's just no wonder Pochettino said after the game we are concerned because he is he is he is Mr. Tottenham. He is Mr. Tottenham and he's the best thing about Harry Kane is his mentality. <laughs> he's got a right foot, left foot, he's good in the air, he can run the channels, he could do everything. Yeah. But his best thing is his mentality. His ability just to keep going and going and never let things get him down. I don't think he has his best game today in front of goal. Of course, you expect him to score a few of the opportunities, but his link up play, the way that he comes into the ball. I love it when he drops in that one he played around the corner into the wide area that the alley chance that came around. It was all because of his vision as well. He's absolutely brilliant. Um, I played against him. You know this story probably, yeah. KJ. I played against him when he was on loan at Millwall, uh, one of his first loan spells and, it must have been 2010. I can't remember. I'm aging myself here. 2011 maybe? Yeah, yeah, maybe. I was at Birmingham and, um, and we went to the den and this lad was outstanding for 30 minutes. We, we won the game 6-0 in the end because they got men sent off. But the first 20, 30 minutes, he was absolutely brilliant. He was just a kid. He was skinny as a rake. He not filled out, anything mm -hmm. like that. But, uh, we had a good partnership, Curtis Davies and I. We conceded very few goals that year, but I remember thinking, wow, this boy's special. And I followed his career closely. He went to Norwich. He didn't play much minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris took him to Norwich as well. And Chris Hutton was yeah. my manager in that game. So he saw someone in that game or in performances as well. And uh, I followed his career closely and I'm delighted that he's doing well. And um, he, he is really special. He's He's got a little bit of everything. He reminds me very much of Alan Shearer. I think he'll break Alan Shearer's Premier League records. Wow. I don't think he'll ever leave England. Yeah. I don't think he should leave England. Yeah. I'd love to see him stay at Tottenham or, or move to another big English club, but I think he'll break Alan Shearer's record. He's that good. He's got Shearer's mentality um, and, and you know, 
touch wood, as long as he doesn't get badly injured. That's the key. That's the key. Uh, I think he's got a bit more quality than Shearer with both feet, and so I think he'll get more goals. Yeah, nobody wants to see anyone get injured, and obviously in that kind of sport where some kind of some certain injuries uh, can obviously have a direct impact on your career, whether you play on yeah. or not. And you know this, I always lean on my doc- <laughs> I always lean on Dr. Dr. Caldwell, <laughs> as I refer to you at TSN, every time we oh. do it as an injury, because I feel like you know everything about every single injury. I don't know what, you know what, physicals hate players like me. You know, yeah. they think they know their injuries yeah. and they step into things, but I've had you a few. You are pretty myself. good at this. Yeah, I, you know Come what, on. I've got a great deal of respect for physicals there. I'm pretty good at it. And they've, they've always been my friends at clubs that I've been at, you know, been very close with them. Hard to be your Unfortunately, I've spent some time on their beds a bit too much, <laughs> but I normally know. Uh, one thing I'll say again, touch wood, I hope it's not bad. I never want to see great players miss football, but if this is an eight week injury, Harry Kane will be back in five and a half. Right. If this is a 12 week injury, he'll be back in eight or nine. Right. He comes back early all the time because he, he, the way he lives as a professional, uh, you know, his, his ability to recover, which is a great strength. Um, and like I say, the way that he lives his life. And, and so, I hope it's a short-term thing for for Spurs. I think Spurs could be a little bit sleeper in the Champions League as well. They need them back for that. The league campaign's gone. I mean, I still think they're going to have more than enough to be in the Champions League positions at the end of the season, but I, they're not going to catch Manchester City and Liverpool no, now because no. of that result. So to me, the Champions League, they could be a little bit of a surprise force. I don't think they're going to go all the way through and win it, but would I be shocked if they got themselves to semi-final or that? No. No, I agree. Um, before we move on, and just a reminder for regular listeners going forward, these kind of games we're going to be touching on, they won't all be from the Premier League. Sometimes we're going to touch on what's yeah. on our plate going forward. You know, obviously, whether it's from La Liga or Canadian Premier League, MLS, we're going to be touching on this. But before we move on to headlines, I do want to just get to one other game that I think is pretty of note, and that is Chelsea 2, Newcastle 1. Boy, oh boy, Chelsea wish they had Harry Kane. Tottenham fans oh, are just screaming right yeah. now, going, no, sod off. We you have enough good players. Um, yeah. <laughs> Maurizio Sarri, I'm, I'm starting to really enjoy his frankness. He's great. I don't know about you, oh, but he just him. doesn't care no. what he says. And, you know, people, he, he plays behind this, like, little bit manic grandfathery thing where he's not quite sure uh, English. And then, but he's just, he's just as direct as they come. Yeah. He just comes out and just steamrolls people in, 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 in his press conferences sometimes in the most polite way. You know, and, and messages to Abramovich too, by the way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he said, oh, you, you know, he said recently, we just, you know, we're a very good team. We just have a problem scoring, which is <laughs> true. It's very true. Yeah. Everybody who watches Chelsea yeah. every week knows that. Um, and, and then he, he also came out and said after William scored on the weekend, yeah, William's a very good player. We need to keep him. Yeah. In other, and we have this rule at Chelsea where after 30, we only offer one year contracts, which he thinks, I know he thinks he's absolutely ridiculous and why Cesc Fabregas has now gone to the yeah. south of France. Um, so he's another reason why he's basically saying this is a stupid rule. So right now it's working out very well, but I do worry whether it's it's going to become fractious again for Chelsea very quickly. Yeah, um, they, they got out of jail a bit. They weren't great against an average Newcastle. Team. Uh, they were very average uh, Chelsea at the weekend, and, and, and Newcastle did their job well. Again, that the quality just showed in the end. Uh, but I wasn't impressed by their performance at all. <laughs> it's not hard to see. They, they clearly need a centre forward. They're asking their best players to play out of position. Just so that they can get better tactician, uh, tacticians, sorry, technicians. That's the word I was looking for in the team. Pedro got that first goal. Um, you know, they want to get Pedro, William and, uh, Hazard in the team because they just don't trust Giroud or Marata. Marata looks like he might leave. It seems like it might be Wilson. I like Wilson. I'm not sure he's good enough to take Chelsea to the next level. I'm sure. Uh, he's not. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, he's a nice player. I don't, I don't mean to be rude. No, he's I know. a very nice player. They need and we've covered a lot. That, yeah. And if you want to go get Callum Wilson, that's fine. Yeah. But you need to get someone else. Yeah. Right. Higuain or somebody. Like, you need to get somebody else. True world class player. They need to get someone. You're Chelsea. Yeah, you know course. what I mean? Come on. Think, think big. And they really have to show tremendous recruitment here and who they get because. The point of getting this guy is, yes, to, to finish the chances to score goals, but it's to link with Hazard and find a reason to try and convince Eden Hazard to stay at Chelsea. Right. To, to convince Eden Hazard he's going to win more Premier Leagues and really seriously challenge for Champions Leagues. Mm-hmm. And so to do that, this guy needs to be world class. And Callum is not going to do that. No disrespect. No. Good football player. Um, it needs to be someone of... of real serious stand in they're going to have to go out and break the bank and spend mega money on, on that guy in my opinion and, and, and that's the key can they do that will they do that 
um, I've got my doubts. Yeah, it's interesting because I read an article recently how it was a great time to watch World Class Number Nines, and I felt myself thinking, I don't really think Ooh. it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, there is not a lot of them out there. I've got this quote that I tweeted earlier this week that I have in my World Cup book that I think is really apt. Edin Hazard, your World Cup novel, I should say. <laughs> Edin Hazard. First of all, Thierry Henry, when he was on Sky Sports, I watched him as a pundit once, and he said this: Hazard loves to play with and off a number nine. And that was a Belgian assistant manager. And then yeah. Hazard has also said, and I've written this down, when I pass the ball, the defender looks at the target man with the ball, then they forget about me. And it's that extra run. Yeah. And that's what we're not seeing right now. The classic was the Willian goal. Hazard picked up the ball, drove into a, a you know, a forest of four or five yeah. defenders, passed the ball out to William. What did William have? A one-on-one shift inside the fullback and curled it into the corner. That was a hazard goal yeah. in a hazard position scored by William, who, by the way, hasn't scored enough this season. So maybe it was a good thing. Mm-hmm. But my point being, that's where you want hazard, really. Yeah. You know what I mean? To make the massive impact on the match. He's got to be a free player to go wherever he yeah. wants. And when he's the number nine, the responsibility is at times to be in the middle of the park. He, he needs to have that free reign, that free roll. I love it when you see him roaming around. He does such unconventional things, Hazard, that only he could do and get away with. There was one uh, yesterday and Saturday, he plays it into William. He sort of goes to go down the channel. It doesn't happen. He goes offside. He comes back alongside William and, and because of his ability, William just gives him it right back. You know, he gives him that little side pass and yeah. he does things like that all the time. We were watching a game recently. He got the ball. He sees it in a split second. He could play it into Marata. I think it was last week, was it? When yeah. and he doesn't play the pass. That's right. And he saw it. There's no doubt about it. A player of his quality. It, it was on. He didn't have confidence in his centre forward. Didn't mm-hmm. want to play it. He knew that nothing would come from it. So he kept it a bit too long. It wasn't the right thing for the team. But you can see his frustration in the way that he's playing. They need to get him. They need to go and get a world class number nine. I don't know who you think that is, KJ. Yeah, we'll have I to don't think, think it's Higuain, that. but no, I certainly sure think he's got more quality than, than 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 some or than a lot. But I, 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 there's not a lot of them out there. Harry Kane is the man. They're never going to get him, in my opinion. No, the biggest fear for Chelsea fans is now is is Hazard getting a little bit of that what I call Arsenal fever where he's becoming too big for the club and he's looking around and they're going hang on a minute you ain't going to sign any players of my quality I'll go find some players yeah. to play with instead do you know what I mean and yeah. that's I never thought I would say that recently of Chelsea but it co- just shows you how quickly it comes Yeah. Um, before we move on quickly I do think Newcastle exposed a little bit of vulnerability in Chelsea and that's direct play I think the goal Dubravka was going long a lot yeah. it led to a chance early from of when Rondon won the ball from Luis if you get into a football game with them you're going to lose so there's no point playing it through midfield. But I do think and there's a lot of quite a few times now where they've conceded goals in the air in aerial abilities, goals from set pieces. I think about the Cardiff yeah. one earlier this season against them when 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 Bang scored that goal. Uh, I just think there's a bit of a vulnerability. The Jorginho one, I think I should save for another podcast because I'm again a little bit worried about him slowing the game down. Yeah. And there's a bit of anxiety in the stadium when he starts getting the ball. He's not quite loved as much as I thought it would be. I still think we can get into that in another show. There's a lot to like about him, but yeah. some things. The other thing is, Marcus, is Alon- Marcus Alonso is not good enough. Oh, he is not good that. enough. He is, I, and I've been watching him for a long time, and I did a podcast a year ago, and, and somebody asked me, is the one player in world football who you look at and you think, everybody thinks he's great and you don't and I, I it was him yeah and he's he, and whether he's a fantasy premier league darling or whatever it was because he was scoring all these goals <laughs> as a defender and he's good but i'm sorry he's just nowhere near good enough for that team uh, he, he's not uh he's good going forward but he leaves so many gaps that that quality sides can uh really get in behind them and really cause problems and i think that <laughs> David Luiz is, is one of the most creative central defenders we've seen of his Great generation. Great pass for the goal for the first Great pass for the goal. Pass. He played about six, seven, eight of them yeah. during the game. I'm talking 40, 50 yard passes as well. Left foot, right foot, stepping into play. He must have been on the ball more than anybody else. Uh, we should check the stats on that. But a brilliant player, but not a great defender, not a physical defender. It's almost like is secondary to defend, yes. isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah. Van Dijk's good on the ball, but he wants to defend. Right. Luis is, feels like he's too good to defend sometimes, I think, in my opinion. And so to have him next to Alonso, the point I'm making is next to Alonso, it creates that real gap and vulnerability in, in that side. And that, I think good teams will really exploit mm-hmm. Chelsea there. So they, they need to find a way to, to, to solidify that back line a little bit. It, is it, 
Canty's good in the forward area, but why is he not playing that more defensive role? Even alongside Jardinho, you yeah, tell me. Yeah, they could play it as a two, but it's just, I mean, Sarri wants this 4 3 3. He believes in it. He thinks it's the right way to play. I get I it, but you a, need the pieces, no? Yeah, they do. They need the pieces. Do you agree? I agree. And for me, the tempo is too slow. Yeah. The tempo of the way that they play, Jorginho slows it. I'm, and I'm an enormous fan and I know why he's playing yeah. there and I'm not advocating he gets removed, but he slows the game down and that's a bit of a concern. Do you me. think he's doing that more now yes. in the latter part? I, I thought in the early part of the season he was keeping it quick, yep. playing vertical passes really yep. quickly, much like he did at Napoli. To me, he's slowing it down. Yep. Now, that may be the defensive shape of other teams, True. or it may just be him feeling the pace of the Premier League as well. Yep. This is a difficult league to get used to and he started so well, you thought, oh, he's got a, you know, got the hang of it right away. But some reason, he's he, he's looking a little bit leggy in a lot of areas. Of yeah, the game. interesting to keep an eye on that. And by the way, that also compounds another problem: the goal scoring because them three don't score. Kante's got three this year, but yeah. Kov- Kovacic and Jorginho don't score. Jorginho got a penalty. You know what I mean? They just don't score. Yeah. So you've got no goals in the team either. So a few issues there. Um, before we get to Shawnee in the headlines, we have to address. Rio Ferdinand's bizarre comments on um, BT Sport about Newcastle. If you saw this, yes, but I'm I sure did. you did. Um, we, I, I don't know whether to just throw, you know, a, a two-footed tackle into his analysis or whether you want to do that, <laughs> but it was just <laughs> moronic. No, just what, what like, first, I don't know what he's saying. like, first of all, for those who missed it, he was, a, he was a big advocate for Mike Ashley. Um, I'm, not going to quote him, but he basically was saying Mike Ashley's put £50 million pounds of his own money into it to get them back to promoted. Um, by the way, no, he didn't. He generated £80 million pound on sales because Sissoko, Vinealdum, Townsend, Jan, Matt, Cabell, any, do you want me to continue the list? They were all on sale, oh. so your facts are wrong right away. Um, he's basically saying they should be happy, Newcastle fans. This guy is lucky to have Rafa yeah, look, Benitez. Lucky to have Rafa Benitez. Mike Ashley is not the reason why Rafa Benitez is at Newcastle. Newcastle United and what that badge means and what that place means and that fan base means is the reason why Rafa Benitez is at Newcastle not because of the guy sitting in his ivory tower no. it's what that club means to that fuck to that franchise yeah Rafa Benitez wouldn't be wouldn't lower himself to be on Premier League consistent Premier League relegation battles or getting championship promotions yeah. for a club if it wasn't Newcastle United and what that place meant 100% so I don't know it's just embarrassing just embarrassing it was embarrassing and uh... He kept going on and on about it as well. You could see Jake Humphreys next to him there. He couldn't believe it. He Outstanding. Was brilliant and questioning, yeah. you know, like really uh, coming at him and, you know, asking him why he was saying the remarks. And he just stuck to it and stuck to it. And, oh, I was watching it through. I, was surp- I, I, I like my hands Rio. over my eyes. And I, I was, was surprised a little bit. Do you know? Yeah. I mean, it's not, I mean, there were, I'm not going to name them, but there was a few ex players who could have said that. And I'd be like, yeah, that's just standard for, yeah. you, for you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's not really And there's like some people Rio, have, qu- yeah. I'm, that's not, I'm, this is not for me to say, but there's some people have questioned Rio because of his business interest and there's yeah. a conflict of interest there with Sports Directs. Maybe that's the case. I'm not going to say that. Um, but that's what some people are questioning. But I just felt it was quite uncharacteristically, un- uh, um, just, off, way off the mark, yeah. you know, like it's just, there's just actual facts that back up that you just, the stuff you're saying is just ridiculous. Yeah. If you don't say the facts to the fans or, or about one of the clubs in that area, and I know better than most of them played for Sunderland and Newcastle, you're going to get destroyed, KJ. Yeah. And, and, and rightly so. If you, if you're getting it wrong and he was very inaccurate with his facts, the, the 50 million one was just absurd, wasn't it? I mean, I don't know the exact details. I knew right away that it was yeah. completely made up, you know. And then to almost a- attack a very, very proud fan base in the Newcastle, uh, upon Tyne area and, and, and say that they're lucky to have Rafa Benitez. That man's sticking around there, like you've, you've said, because of the fans, because of that area, because of the hotbed, what it means to represent that club out with. All the mess he's got to deal with on a daily basis because of Mike Ashley mm. and what he's brought and what he's taken away from him and given his absolute best, one of one of the world's best managers, um, was was crazy from Rio. Uh, I don't see him doing a game at St James's Park <laughs> anytime soon because <laughs> be. he'll struggle to get in the game. He'll need about four police cars and, and five motorcycles if he wants to get in there or at least get out. 
Well, Rio, if you are listening, I'm sure you are, <laughs> it, 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 to finish on some facts, and it is a Rafa Benitez uh, chat, so here's some facts, as Rafa Benitez once said in his press conference. 11 years in charge of Newcastle, an average annual net spend of £2.6 million. The team has spent £350 more million, £354 million since 2007 on players. They've recouped £322 million. By the way, they get an enormous amount of television revenue since um, eight times outside the top half of the Premier League obviously two relegations six players signed uh, six players have been sold for over 15 million pounds no players have been signed for over 15 million pounds. and how many people are there every week KJ every in week. the stands every week thick or thin yeah. biggest crowd in the championship yeah. when they've been in that league as well and so. let's just hope that quickly we can move on from the Mike Ashley era because that football club will be better for it in our opinion anyway Shawnee let's get to some headlines around the world Sweet. Okay, let's go. Uh, CSA announced um, this week a new uh, format for the Canadian Championship. Uh, 13 teams. The addition of the CPL obviously changes this turnip quite a bit. Uh, 24 matches. They're still doing uh, home and homes, uh, two legs. Uh, what do you guys think? Um, there's some weird additions of some CPL clubs coming in in the second round and some coming in the first round. <laughs> Canadian soccer complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all, all on the basis of who had the check at the door First, yes, 2017 yeah. registrations due to 2018 registrations. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then TFC only has to win two rounds to lift the cup again. Right. So, do you like this format? Do you do you think there's another option for this format, or are you just happy? Let's see these games play, being played. Uh, a little bit of everything for me. Um, doing my due diligence to try to reach out to a couple of people to find out what the reasoning was behind this. Look. Uh, I understand social media can sometimes not be an accurate barometer for everything because many often it is if you want to read negativity towards something, just go there. But it has been, I don't know whether it consistently slammed, but it hasn't been welcomed by many people because of the convoluted... Safe to say. Yeah, safe to say. Oh, thanks, Shoni. I thought you might know more than I would. (laughs) Um, So I'm I'm glad to go there. So it hasn't been accepted well by a lot of people. Um, First of all, I think that's the problem right away. And I will tell them to their faces, or if they're listening, see, they should have got out ahead of the message these days. Have a press conference, have a conference call, explain the reasoning for doing it. I think that might have been a, a wise decision right away. Um, when it was first announced, I, I, I'll be honest, I met it with excitement. I was just happy to see this this go this way. More discussion and more thought, um, thought, thought process around the format. I think they could have done a better job for it, Stevie. Um, maybe yeah. they'll learn from that. I personally would like one legs. I don't know about you. Uh, one-legged games just get out of a straight knockout and then yeah. they could have maybe had a few more uh, of those because I think there is a concern certainly from the MLS clubs well I know there's a concern from the MLS clubs that they don't want to be playing an enormous amount of matches during that time so that's why they've tried they're trying to take care of them in this way as well but um, yeah not an ideal launch but uh, let's hope it gets modified and, and we continue to talk positive about it well the first thing I want to say is I'm pleased that it's a legitimate Canadian Championship now we've yeah. got a number of teams in it so it's it's, it's grew through the years and it's became something that, that's going to be quite exciting because you know it's going to be a little bit like a very miniature FA Cup where you, you know you have the, the, the giant killing act in play and, that, and that's what makes it uh, better this year than it has been in previous years but this format's just ridiculous I'm sorry it's it's too complicated. You, you start a franchise in 2017 compared to 2018. Who really cares? You know, the league's not even launched. Nobody knew before now, really. No, right. This actually so, highlighted that I'm all... We've not even played a game in the league. You know, how does that give you, you know, the round earlier or uh, or the round later, I should say. I, I just don't like it. I'm going to come up with something that I thought would have been a bit more simple. I agree go with you. To, go I, with it. Go I think it. TFC got the bye because of the Champions League and the too many games and the, the the home and away aspect. And I don't like that right away. I don't like them getting all the way to that stage. I think the three MLS clubs should have stayed out yet. The other 10 teams should have played in a game against each other, home or away, draw the thing, uh, keep the ones apart, see that, I don't know, I can accept that part of it. Yep. Five teams go through, there's three MLS teams, just have a straight out quarterfinal draw, semi-final and final and see how it goes. And let's get the, you know, the romanticism in the Canadian Championship up. Let's see if TFC can play against York 9 or Von Azuri or whoever, you know, or, or Ottawa Fury against, uh, you know, some of the matchups that could come that would be very exciting for, for Canadian football. Mm-hmm. That's what I'd like to see happen because in this format, what we're going to see is TFC, Montreal, and Vancouver, and I'm sorry if I'm being disrespectful to any other teams, going through one other, probably Ottawa Fury, 
And we're away, we're at the same Canadian Championship as we've had. This in format previous certainly years. does that. It assures yeah. that they're going to have MLS team in the final. It's heavily weighted. And two legs also, I think, also it's difficult to beat. Like, if you want the romanticism of the FA Cup, it's, it, you know, it, it, Newport's not beating Leicester over two legs, but no. they beat them at home 2-1. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's yeah. my that's point. Your that's chance, what we, your that's home your game. Chance, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. What do you guys think of the final? Because the final is going to be later in the tournament. It, like It's the September 25th. It's the second leg. Yes. And that's going to be within like two two weeks of the last game yeah, of the MLS true. season. So if there's teams going down to the wire and, and have to make the playoffs, do they start sitting some players for the Canadian National? Like the... Mm. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's an interesting. Uh, it's one. a good question. Um, I think they need to do a better job of making it a bigger deal. The yeah. Concacaf Champions League is the carrot that dangles here, um, but I think there was only fourteen or fifteen thousand at BMO for the second leg of, yeah. quite, of a very at the time it was a blowout the game, but at the time it was tantalising because mm-hmm. it was on the knife edge in terms of who was going to win that match. Yeah, and it just for whatever reason, and we can get into it. But we're not going to get into it now. But obviously, having to pay tickets, not part of season tickets, whatever it is, um, there was just not the interest there at that time. And I understand that in the summer, sometimes it's very difficult. So maybe pushing it into September when it's a little bit more, I don't know, there's less things going on. People, people, more people are around. We all live in this great city. Yeah. There's a lot of people who leave in August and go different places. So maybe that will help the popularity. That's the only one thought I had of that. Yeah. No, I, I, I had sort of two, two sides of thought. The one being that it might cause some problems, but on the other side, it's, it gives us something at the end of the year. If you're not having a great year, mm. like if Toronto FC had a cup final at the end of the season, it just gives you something and, and something to strive for yeah. as opposed to having a, a trophy lifted in August where it could get lost. It just sort of gives the fan base a little bit more to, to reflect on. Good point. Uh, moving, moving forward, uh, MLS, um, Benny Filehuber signed with Colorado, uh, Ozzy Alonso signed with Minnesota. Which one's the better signing? Um, two elder statesmen in MLS. Um, both both clubs are a bit dire right now. So mm. is, it, is is this going to matter at all? Um, I like Fail Harbor more than Alonso myself, only because I think he has an ability from a deeper position to be a bit more of a playmaker, which I think that role is starting to become a little bit more. We talked about Jorginho over the, a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, I think both are 33. Um, it'd be interesting to see. I'm sure Minnesota and that environment need Alonzo's winning mentality into that team. Yeah. That, that's what I do like about that. Uh, I like Alonzo better because of that reason, KJ. Right. I think they really need that player at the base of their midfield. I've sort of missed it. Colin Warner played some minutes here, did really well, but they never quite found that mainstay in that position. I think the, the, the ability of Alonzo, he's a winner, a uh, proven winner and, um, the, the way that he can dictate the, the pace of a game, I think will be really important in Minnesota. Uh, Benny Phil Harbour's been an utter terrific player. I think it's a good signing from Colorado, but I'm just leaning towards Alonso in, in, in respect to the, the importance or the, the effect he can have on his team. Great. Uh, moving to Europe. Um, Aaron Ramsey, it's still not 100% official, but it sounds like he's going to Juventus, um, on a free, um, there's been some contract issues with Arsenal over the last little while. What's going on? Just who's, a bit. who's who's to blame? Um, is is this back from Wenger's days and his mismanagement, or or is this sort of just uh, more of a, a top down from the entire group at Arsenal? Yeah, look, it's clear. I think they're they're head of business there. Raul Sunley, he came in this season, has been taking a little bit more control. I think he put it best when he said in. Uh, maybe November of October. I can't remember when it was now, but um, he said, you know, you cannot run a business like that. And it is an absolute disgrace that Arsenal Football Club in 2019, no matter what you think of Aaron Ramsey, the player, in 2019, at a 28 years old, a homegrown player, international, and you're going to let this asset run down for nothing. Oh, and by the way, you were going to do it with Sanchez, which you had to cash in for Mkhitaryan, who's been rubbish for you. And you were going to do it for, with Ozil, who then held you in a room until you gave him £350,000 per week. And now he doesn't even make the match day squad. So and now you're going to let Ramsey leave because... Aaron Ramsey's going to sign, by the way, it's an enormous contract. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a massive amount of money. Um, we'll pull it up in a second. It's going to be the third, if it's true, the third highest paid player in Italy. But of course you can do that because you ain't giving yeah. Arsenal any money. So here you go, Rambo. Here's a whole package of money for you. Of course. And they're getting a player for free. So yeah, you can pay them whatever you want in wages. You make sure you get them because you're getting a, 
don't know anywhere between forty and ninety million pound player. Correct. You know? Yeah. So you give them whatever you want, but how can that be allowed to happen at a club like Arsenal to get to that point? It's absolutely ridiculous. And uh, if it happened once, you would say, okay, a little bit of a mistake, mismanagement. Mm -hmm. You hit the nail on the head, KJ, Sanchez and Ozil and all the other players that's happened to as well. It's um, it's, it's a disgrace and it's very disappointing. I would be raging, a word that I use very often, KJ, isn't raging. it? If I, You're raging, <laughs> raging, raging, raging. I'd be raging if I was an Arsenal fan. Um, Ramsey, uh, from his point of view, I, I like Ramsey as a football player. I don't think he's of the class of Juventus, but... I have nothing against the guy going there. Any professional football player thinks that, that, you know, they're capable of going somewhere and playing, but I don't see him getting a lot of meaningful minutes at Juventus. But again, I must say to, to go abroad and to play football in Serie A for a storied club like Juventus. Yeah, every credit What to an opportunity. Yeah. The clubs that he had, I mean, he had PSG, he had Bayern Munich, yeah. he had Juventus, if, if rumours are to be believed, all waiting to sign him because... Guess what? You're getting a 50, 60 million pound player for nothing. You That's can give right. them three, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand pound a week. What does it matter? You're getting this, this asset that's going to be really good. You could keep them for a year, year and a half, Make and you back. can sell them for about 30 million. Make you know? your money back. And that's what, look, if it is, if the reports are true and he is going to sign this deal, which I believe is for five years, and it is five years, um, paying him 140,000 pounds net. Per, yeah. per week, which is yeah. very important to say, net. Um, then you know you basically you out you outlay for the first two years. You can recoup very easily when the inevitable will be. Rambo goes, mm, I'm bad enough here. Yeah. I want to go back to the Premier League. They go, all right, well, oh, who wants him? You know, Man United. You want him? Okay, sixty million pounds. <laughs> He's thirty. We'll give, you can have him for 60 yeah. million. And by the way, that'll be nothing by then. Callum Wilson's going for 50 million now in 2019. Yeah. So Aaron Ramsey's a 30 year old. Even if he never plays or plays minimal minutes for Juventus over the next two years, his reputation won't be tarnished. He can go back. It'd be cost him. And Juventus will say, happy days. We just made all that money on it. it, it, it no wonder every team in Europe wants him because right. it's, it's, it's an makes asset. financial sense to Correct. bring him in and give him whatever he wants and say, we'll give him a go. We'll, we'll play him in some games. Who knows? He might. Yeah. end up being you know extremely good they might end up developing I like Aaron Ramsey as a player I'm just not sure that he, he's at that level but uh, from Arsenal's point of view how can it happen how can they allow that to get to that how can they allow a, a guy who clearly gives his best and is you know uh, uh, want, wanted to be at the football club mm. uh, to, to get to this point and he's German ex German international mate is sitting there on his 315. Well, I'm sure that had a direct less. impact, no? 100%. Right. Because as soon as you see a guy who's not given his absolute utmost, get paid that much. Getting paid that much, say, wait a sec here, I'm coming into training every week. I'm giving my best as a player and uh, as an employee of Arsenal Football Club. I want that. You know, I'll wait for my chance and I'll ask for that or I'll ask for somewhere in the vicinity of that. And then they don't want to pay it to a guy who's. Gives his, his absolute all, but they'll give it to yeah. uh, a wonderful player who'll play whenever he fancies, who, you know, can't be relied upon now. Right. It's a disgrace. They should be, Arsenal fans should be in an uproar about this. Raging. Raging. <laughs> Uh, moving on, uh, shocking, uh, Neymar's in the news again. Uh, it sounds like he might be on the move, but once again, could be just agent speak. Uh, by the end of this... Dad speak, Sean. <laughs> Dad speak, sorry. <laughs> Get it right. By the end of 2019, uh, do you suspect... Neymar is on the move again, or do you see him staying at, in PSG? I, I think he's on the move. And I, I thought that from day one, the moment that he went to Paris, actually he came to Paris when I was there, uh, that's a small little note. That, that <laughs> Did I was you hang out with No, I didn't. I mean, I gave him a call. I but, thought you'd be at some fashion shows no, or something like No, that. never. Uh, <laughs> fashion shows, have you seen me? Um, no, look, uh, he seems like, very, he seems as if that he flirted with PSG. He loved the little affair that they had with him. He's gone there. He's got into into this relationship. It isn't really satisfying for him. And he's like, hang on a minute. I'm a bit better than you. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he got the player of the year last year, played 20 matches. You know what I mean? Every week he's winning games for fun, whether yeah. he's playing or not. The team's just, just destroying opposition. And in the Champions League, they haven't got it done. So, of course, he wants to go. He wants to go play with big players. Want to play yeah. with big players? Yeah, he wants to play in big leagues, right? Big as leagues, well. Yeah, you know, I where, he's, think, where he's actually challenged. In fairness, he's playing with big players at PSG, but he's. We always see him in these Instagram videos, playing in these charity games, flicking over his head. Now yeah. he plays like that in Ligue 1 as well, he doesn't does, he? Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's like this guy's constantly 
playing in a charity match, playing in an exhibition game because it's too easy for him in, in France, especially with the, the personnel that he has alongside him at mm-hmm. PSG and he's bored and he wants to come back to a legit, legitimate league and uh, he's going to do that. He's, he's going to do He's proved before when he left Barcelona that when he is completely ready, he's just going to make it happen. Mm-hmm. They've got no choice. I know PSG have financial might, but he's just going to drag his heels he won't play a game he'll just be completely difficult and, and in the end they'll, they'll have to sell him he's not going back to Barcelona no I can't afford him can and I? I hope this is not chronicled this uh, podcast if I'm wrong <laughs> no he's not going back to Barcelona because he left there because he wants to be the main man mm. but I think he's going to Spain really I think he might go to Real Madrid yeah he could do that Yeah, I that... don't see him in England no do you I think he'll go wherever it, someone's going to take him at this point. I think there's very few teams who, one, will can afford him. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's that's straight yeah. away. Um, so, you know, could he... What could, would your hunch be? Where would you say? Um, I would probably say Real Madrid as well. Yeah. Yeah. At Barcelona, by the way, him and his family are taking Barcelona to court right, right. now. Um, yeah. But he still wants to go there. So I'm sure that can <laughs> kind of be arranged <laughs> otherwise. Um, Galatico era for Real Madrid. They're a shambles right yeah. now. Why not? They need a big guy, yeah, don't they? they need a big guy. And they um, need a goal scorer. So I think that fits a little bit more than than the Barcelona one. Moving on. Uh, Chess Fabregas uh, moving to Monaco. You mentioned it earlier in the show. Um, this has got to be his last sort of time in England. Um, overall, what do you think of his career and his time in England and how will he be remembered? Oh, wow. Great question. Um, I'll take the journalistic point of view, first of all, before the man who can give a better answer who actually played against Fabregas. Um, for me, Fabregas is one of the biggest influences of modern day football of this era. And I say that mainly because of Vienna to Donetsk, 2008 European Championships quarterfinal. Spain were known as perennial chokers. Teams have missed penalties, loose penalty shootouts. 21-year-old Cesc Fabregas was asked at that time by Luis Aragonas, I want you to take the fifth penalty. And he hadn't taken a penalty, he hadn't taken a penalty since he was 15 years old. <laughs> and he stepped up and he scored that penalty and he changed his mind in the last second against Gigi Buffon. And he scored the penalty and it changed football history. And then four years later, they played Portugal in Donetsk in the semi-final, and they go to penalties again after 120 minutes and Del Bosque and his assistant present the, the five takers and Fabregas is second and he's steaming. And at that point, he challenges the coaches to change the order and say, no, I want to be fifth. I was fifth four years ago and I had a premonition this morning that I'm taking the fifth penalty and I'm, we're going to win. So the assistant gives him a look and Del Bosque goes, change it. And he read his mind, he read his body language and Fabregas was the fifth taker and he scored it and they won. And for me, that says a lot about Fabregas, the guy, young guy like that in a massive team of massive personalities, Casillas, Xavi, Alonso, Iniesta, Ramos. You can go on and on and on. And he found his way and he found his niche as to be the leader. And look, as a player, I'm stunned Chelsea let him go. We talked a little bit earlier about Jorginho. He was looking tired. You could play him in that position. He didn't get a lot of minutes under Conte when they won the, the, the league because of the 3-4-3. Three, three. You can't trust him defensively as a two, but in a three, you can, I mean, he's just a wonderful footballer. Uh, one of the best foreign football players to ever play in the Premier League. Outstanding. Um, the story that you just told just is another example of, of what he is, is his mentality. Yes, he's a wonderful player, but yeah. to do things like that, to, to leave the comfort of Barcelona and, and to go to Arsenal as a 16 year old, as a kid, younger than that, even when he first came, uh, tells you what he's all about. And, uh, then to be a great success back to Barcelona. Had some great moments, but he had two guys by the name of Xavi and Iniesta yeah. ahead of him and, and Busquets at the base of that midfield. So how unfortunate do you need to be there? Because he would have played for Barcelona for a decade if the guys weren't the same age as him or right. similar age and, and, and in that position. Uh, and then the success that he had coming back to Chelsea, I, I think he warranted that. Uh, I played against him a few times, KJ. Once at the Emirates, <laughs> he put the ball through my legs. I'll never forget it. It was in the box as well. Coldwell got nutmeg? I, you know what? I actually never got nutmeg that much, <laughs> but it's one of the, you, you know, rem- I like to you tackle. You remember them, eh? Right, so I do. never, yeah, yeah. But I like to tackle. So I see this opportunity to come in and just smash him. Well, I also like smashing people as well. <laughs> and he was an annoying little so-and-so yeah, on the pitch as well. Yeah, he was very arrogant. He yeah. was very arrogant, rightly so. Yeah, I like- actually said to him one time, he was he was moaning away and he was just being tesk. And I said to him, why do you do that? And he looked at me as if to say, what do you mean? I says, 
you're so good. You don't need to be like that. Yeah. If I was you, I would I'm glad never you told even, that story. I would never even open my mouth. I would just look at people and, and just think, who are you? You know, <laughs> but he was, he was very spiky. He put it through my legs. I went sliding by and he set up an opportunity and thankfully they never scored. <laughs> uh, the other time I played against him was at Turf Moor and I don't know how to explain this eloquently. He played like he was in slow motion, but he was faster than everybody on the field. Right. And I don't I don't mean running around. We all know he wasn't that gifted with his pace, but his ability to read where the ball was going, to move it so sublimely with his feet, to pass it at the right moment, to carry it at the right moment, to make the right decisions was incredible. And I'll never forget coming in at halftime, looking at the guys and saying, why can't we get near him? Like, what is going on? Normally, you see a player, you know, you see a drug burn, you know why he's dominating, or you see a Rooney, and you, you get why they're good. With Sesk, it was really difficult to get it. It was like you were in quicksand or in running a treacle, and he was just dancing around the field. A wonderful football player. I'm so privileged that I got the opportunity to share a picture with him, even though he was a cheeky little so-and-so. <laughs> but um, a, a great ambassador for Spain in general and uh, a, a, a great player in the Premier League. And last up, uh, if you want to talk uh, about anything specific uh, during this, so make sure to uh, follow us on Twitter, at a football pod, and use the hashtag AskAFP, and we will discuss that on the show. Yes, please do. We love to be interactive on this show, so please send in those hashtags and those questions. All right, now let's get to our special guest. Let's get Mr. Victor Montagliani on the phone. Well, we are delighted now to bring on Victor Montagliani, Vice President of FIFA, President of CONCACAF. I guess the first thing, Vic, is Happy New Year. How are you? Very good, thank you. Happy New Year, both of you, and uh, really glad to uh, be on your uh, podcast and um Hopefully 219 is a great year for you both professionally and personally. Thank you. And likewise, Thank you. thanks for thanks for the kind words. Likewise to you. Let's get into it then, Vic. Uh, 2019, an expanded Gold Cup. Is that, I guess, the one of the major things on your plate for, for a successful 2019? And maybe get into the reasons why um, you, you're enjoying the fact that it is getting expanded into that 16 teams this year. Yeah, we. Uh, it was something that we uh, sort of, you know, said early on in, in my presidency that something that I thought was important um, and as we see with the Nations League which is another important part of our future with some of the results that are occurring in the Nations League um, that I'm excited that the, uh, that the countries that are going to qualify are going to be interesting countries some that have not been there before but all of a sudden some talent that's being exposed in our region so we're, we're, we're pretty excited pretty pleased with the progress and uh, having 16 teams and also on top of that is having two venues for the first time outside of North America uh, one we announced uh, about a month ago with Costa Rica first time ever we're bringing the Gold Cup to Central America and we will soon announce um, a venue uh, in the Caribbean um, uh, and for the first time we're bringing the Gold Cup uh, to the Caribbean as well so so it's not just on the pitch that we're excited about. It's also off the pitch. And as you saw, I think the Gold Cup is really resonating with uh, fans. Uh, Minnesota, our first time venue ever, sold out in day. So uh, with their matches. So so we're quite excited about it. And obviously, it doesn't hurt when uh, your two uh, behemoths of Mexico and the U.S. have coaches. Canada has a new coach. And, uh, and some young players that are coming to the horizon with Pulisic and Mr. Davies who made his debut today. Um, so, you know, a lot of things are happening on the pitch and also off the pitch to make the goal, this Gold goal Cup, uh, I think, maybe one of the best ever. Stephen here, Vic. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned that there, and I think the excitement of the growth of the game within the, the CONCACAF region is very important. Is it your objective to try and look into some of these smaller nations and try and get maybe more scope, more places for these players to play and, and try and bring attention to, to their regions, their countries, to try and develop them and, and improve them uh, internationally? Yeah, you know, as we see with, as we've seen everywhere in the world, you know, football, football is not, um, is not owned by, uh, by countries that have big GDPs or countries that have big populations. Football belongs to everyone. And so there's no reason why countries with small GDPs, small populations in our region 
couldn't um, be successful. And as we've seen with the nations, that you can see a country like Montserrat, uh, it should be on nine points, is on six points, and knocking on it, perhaps qualifying for the Gold Cup, a country of 5,000 5, people. And so, and I think what's happening is a lot of, a lot of uh, these countries are now uh, being exposed uh, to um, players, not just them, uh, where players are now that have a heritage uh, getting, you know, uh, uh, lineage or uh, saying I can have an international career by playing for the country of my, my father and mother or, or, or grandfather or grandmother. And so I think it, um, I think that, um, you're going to see this region. I think, uh, to me, it's the sort of next growth area of football is our region. And I think you're starting to see the early signs of that already. So Vic, let's lay it out there over the next two or three years. What's, the timeline for you guys obviously you mentioned the Nations League prelim which has been a, a, a magnificent success so far uh, in, in, in the back end of 2019 you're going to roll out the major Nations League which will conclude I believe in March 2020 when do you believe and, and I know the format's still not necessarily been discussed yet so maybe it's a two-part question but what kind of format do you think might be the plan for the World Cup and CONCACAF 20, 2022 qualif- qualification process and if you can't necessarily talk too much about that when do you believe that whole format that will start? Well, a couple of things. I can talk about a few things I, uh, because there's a few things up on the air. One, uh, first and foremost, we will have the draw. Uh, uh, we'll, it will be in March, right after, soon after the last uh, game of the preliminary of the Nations League, we will have the draw for the Nations League itself. So we will know who's in League A and who's in League B and who's in League C. So that will happen in March. Uh, once our Nation League kicks off, then we'll be, uh, then the Nations League will act as a ranking system for uh, World Cup qualification of where you would be put into World Cup qualified once we determine what the format is. Uh, if the, that is also predicated on what happens in Qatar and what FIFA decides to do. So if Qatar stays at 32 teams, the likelihood that we will still have a hex type of format is obviously uh, not only high, but it's a probability. But if Qatar all of a sudden um, becomes a 48-team World Cup, like is being studied by FIFA, then we need to look at um, a hex is obviously not a uh, not a probability because we would have six and a half uh, spots. So we would have to look at retooling our own World Cup qualifying uh, for Qatar. So World Cup qualifying uh, is. Um, we probably is a wait and see, um, but um, the Nations League will be will play a, part, uh, a prominent role and a key role in whatever World Cup format we decide to go with. And d- during that timeline, Vic, um, obviously the World Cup qualifying is starting later now within the cycle because of the Nations League. Is there a chance that the qualification process, not just in CONCACAF, and I know you're in a lot of the committees, might extend to the same year as the World Cup with the World Cup being stretched back? Because I know, obviously, some of this format is being shortened because of the Nations League, but with the World Cup 2022 happening in November and December, is it is there any way that it might spill into the beginning of 2022, the qualification process? From the from the uh, renderings that I've seen right now, no. Right. Um, right now, we could fit it into the FIFA windows, where we would have the playoffs in November, um, as we do now, and then the draw in December, so you know who your 32 teams are the following year. It just would be, rather than June, it would be a November kickoff thing. Uh, but if it does go to 48 teams, that might have to change, KJ, because uh, we may have to dip into the March windows, and that means your draws right after that. Um, so that, 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 is a, that is a possibility if the with the uh, number of teams Now, obviously, we don't know about the expansion in terms of 48 for 20, 2022, but we do know for 2026. And you and I have had a lot of discussions about this. Uh, and for our listeners' point of view, I'd love for you to present your case because I know that your opinions on this um, are strong. You're a big fan of the 48-team World Cup, aren't you, Vic? And maybe some of the reasons why, tell us. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of it because if you if you look, I mean, I mean, listen, uh, uh, we're all, we're all in some ways, especially for those of us that have been in the game for a long time, uh, as players and then whatever else we, we come after. We're all, we're all hard sometimes, but, but if you look at the empirical evidence, if you see, for instance, you're going to have between now and 2026, you're going to have an expanded Euro format. You know, everybody was bitching and complaining about Euro going bigger 
well, we see that there's countries that, you know, traditionally had not been competitive in Euros and all of a sudden are not only qualifying, but obviously going deeper into the tournament. So you're going to have two other Euros that are going to be competitive. You're going to, be, you're going to have three other Gold Cups that are going to be competitive. You're going to have Nations Leagues in Europe and then CONCACAF. And if you saw the early results in the, in the European Nations League, there's some results there that are eye-opening as well. The Dutch making a you know, are on the rise again, as we saw, you know, notwithstanding Germany's uh, uh, relegation, but uh, we know that that's not going to last for long. And uh, so you see that, you see with the amount of investment that's happening at all levels from all countries that uh, I don't think, and you, and you see the quality of teams that have missed out on what the last World Cup in Russia, you know, Chile, Italy, Holland, USA, um, and, uh, and dare I say Canada. Uh, and, uh, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have quality teams. And, um, listen, you're always going to get situations. There's always games, uh, in any tournament format where sometimes you get games that are, you know, stinkers and bomb outs that happen. Um, and uh, you saw it in the UEFA Nations League where Croatia World Cup finalists got smashed by Spain six nothing. You know that's football, and we know that. But I'm confident that in the next eight years, with the proliferation of, of expanded expanded regional tournament, also you saw club competitions. You saw UEFA announce another club competition. Uh, you've seen our own Champions League expanding. You see, um, you know, uh, now new leagues coming on board, like the Canadian League. You're going to see better quality of players come to the forefront, and so I'm I'm less worried about uh, a watered down World Cup with 40 teams. Vic, you were integral in bringing a, a home World Cup to Canada. What sort of things would you like to see put in place to ensure a successful 2026 World Cup and you know, and a lasting legacy beyond the tournament itself? No, listen, I've always said that um, 2026 in itself is a um, a 30-day event in our region and a, you know, whatever many games you're going to get, in our case, it would be 10, which is huge. But if that's all it's going to be, then uh, you're better off not bidding for it. And I said that as president of Canadian soccer. I'm saying that as president of CONCACAF. And it's the same message I sent to Mexico and the U.S. uh, is that, it is really important that the run, the run up for the next eight years and beyond that, that we build on the power of a World Cup, that ensuring that we're investing in the areas that we need to invest in so that you can create success on the pitch. But also things like, for instance, uh, you know, what's happening here in Canada with a, with a new league, uh, with uh, the job that the MLS teams are doing. And we saw, you know, Toronto, I know they had a, a difficult year, but obviously it, it, it's one of the premier clubs in, in the league. Those are things that are, to me, very, very important because that's what underpins the sport, not just hosting a World Cup. And you can't just do that. That's just an event. And as we saw with some other countries who hosted World Cups, if you don't capitalize on it, you're going to miss an opportunity. The last thing you need is to miss that opportunity. So I think it's very important that the leaders of football in our region and the leaders of football in Canada, uh, as we move forward, um, capitalize on an event of this size to leverage it uh, from grassroots to women's football to coaching development to league development to everything. Uh, so I think that, to me, is the key in being very strategic about it. Yeah, I think we would all echo those thoughts and, and, and definitely thoughts, particularly around Canada. On that note, for 2026, Vic, obviously when FIFA announced the, that it was going to be the the three countries for 2026, they, I think, if you you've said you've certainly said privately to me, I think you've said publicly as well as so I said that once that bid goes down, FIFA then take that bid and then basically can modify it however they like it. It's not stuck stuck to the necessary the ramifications of what that bid representative were. So I think a lot of people are still wanting it to be written down in pen rather than in pencil that there will be definitely you know Canada will be definitely hosting games have you heard anything on that no is there a, a gut feeling there that you still believe that that will be the case has it been ratified or verified a little bit more behind closed doors well no I mean there's no concern of Canada not hosting games um, I think um, I think it's more from a perspective of a bid is run by the three countries and they have total control on how they run the bid FIFA has Obviously, no control over that. They just set out the regulations. 
But now that the bid is over, the World Cup is run by FIFA, period. Um, and, and the countries, uh, and even with the new model that FIFA has, I like other World Cups where the local organizing committee played a, a very, very big role. They don't play as big as a role, but there's a lot of collaboration still with the local authorities and obviously with the local federations. And that's something we need to build out with FIFA, um, with, with our three member associations uh, over the next probably 12 months in terms of the governance of it and how that's going to work. But, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, matches being played, uh, you know, the, the numbers that are being thrown out, that, that to me is, uh, obviously a starting point, not an end point. Our guest is Victor Montagliani, Vice President of FIFA and obviously President of the CONCACAF region. For the listeners, I just want to let you know that Victor will be in Toronto on January the 30th and I'll be hosting an event with him at the Empire Club. We'll have a good discussion about a lot of these subjects. So if you want to get tickets, go to empireclub.org and listen to that long chat with me and Vic at the end of this month in Toronto. Vic, while we have you, obviously a lot of news and headlines have been around the Ottawa Fury over the last couple of months um, and, and the sanctioning of, of that football club. Um, I think it's important to get your views on that on the record while we have you what are your thoughts about how that whole process went down any particular regrets about what was kind of aired in, in in public with the dirty laundry and and how do you think that system will go forward yeah i think listen i, I think if uh, you get a copy of our statement that was made um i can't remember exactly the date of it but uh while the process was going on i think we made it very clear um that uh you know we, we don't make statements about uh sanctioning publicly and so I'm not going to make any statements publicly about it. We have a process, uh, a clear process. It's very clear who the, where the authority lies in sanctioning, uh, be, you know, the federation level and then obviously confederation level and then obviously FIFA. And, um, you know, and so, uh, our, our statement was very clear that there's a process. It was not followed, which was probably half the problem. Uh, it was being followed. And once it was followed, then the decisions were made and, you know, it's not the only uh, league or, or club that we're sanctioning. There's others. Um, others don't make the news or others don't issue press releases. But, um, you know, for me, it was a process and it was followed. And now people will uh, push on and play their season in 2019. OK, we'll leave that one there. Last question then, Vic. Um, you were a big proponent and a big advocate and a big believer in one of the reasons and the pillars why in 2019 we've got a professional league, the CPL. What are you looking forward to the most, and what is um, what do you think has maybe been the biggest thing so far that this league has done, and and, and going forward as a positive manner as we are now in January 2019? Yeah, I think the the, the main thing is uh, like like any startup, it doesn't matter what business, it's gonna have uh, it's gonna have its challenges. But I think the main thing is to get going, uh, get started. Which uh, um, I, I'm not sure if they've. Uh, you might know better than me because obviously. I'm, I'm not in touch with every, everything, but, uh, uh, whenever their kickoff date is, you know, it's, listen, it, it's, it, it's not about just football. One of the things we lack in Canada is we haven't created an industry. You know, every other country in the world, some of the countries that, uh, you know, our forefathers are from or that you're from, there's an industry of football. And so people will find their ways in the industry, whether it be at the coaching level, administrative level. Uh, you know, uh, health, a sports science level, just there's an industry. We have not created an industry in Canada for football. Um, and, um, yeah, we had, we've had three MLS teams, but three teams are not, you know, that is way too much effort for them to, to create an industry. And with all due respect, they haven't necessarily, uh, what I would say, uh, created it for just for the Canadian. Um, and so as a Canadian, I think it's, important and uh, I scratch my head when I hear people I don't know any other country any other country in the world that <clears throat> would have, there'll be a debate about your own league <clears throat> like I used to have that debate as the president of Canadian soccer with some people um, you know football is based on two things club and country um, it's important to have club obviously we all have our club affiliations but if you don't have the other part then you are uh, you're not really um invested into the sport and so i think having your own national league uh it doesn't matter the size of your country uh or the scope of it but having some sort of national identity in a league format to me is is paramount for you to create your own industry of football and i think this is a start for for canada um there's other countries in my in our confederation that are doing the exact same thing um Suriname, for instance 
um, and uh, others. And um, I mean, everybody looks at, for instance, I'll give you a, a great uh, story about that is Panama. Uh, you know, everybody looks at Panama now <clears throat> and, you know, they qualified for the first World Cup. I've been competitive in the last few Gold Cups. Well, Panama started this exact journey in a baseball dominant country about 10, 15 years ago. And you know, look where they are now, right? And so um, I think to me, it's quite important that this journey is started by Canada uh, and that uh, and that uh, obviously is sustained for the long term. Yeah, well said. Let's hope we look back in many years to come as a 2019 was a landmark year for Canadian soccer and also the Canadian Premier League. Vic, you're a big part of that. Continue to fly the flag for, the, for Canada and also in the CONCACAF region. And again, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, guys, and uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Vic. Victor Montagliani, Vice President of FIFA and President of CONCACAF. And a reminder, you can hear Vic on many of those thoughts, empireclub.org, at the end of January. And now for the final segment of our show, Ask AFP. It's where we go to Twitter and we ask everyone to tell us what they want us to talk about. Euler Al asks, uh, do you think the CPL should have a playoff style or a single table champion? I like the single table champion because I think it brings a little bit different uh, aspect yeah. to it. And I think, look, we're still in the infancy of finding out what's happening here. Victor Montagliani talks about it earlier, about the launch date. All we know right now is April. So yeah. we don't know too many details. And look, by the way, this will be a big part of our show going forward. We're going to have guests on and, and talk about this Premier, the Premier League going forward. It's a big, we're a big believer of it. We want it to succeed. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that. But no, for, for now, I like that. I never been a big fan of in a seven team I mean not many people have a seven team leagues but if you have a seven team league how are you going to let in if you finish fourth out of seven and then win the cup you know so just keep it as it is for now single table champion seven teams for that reason KJ you can't have uh, the travel as well you know to create a playoff system I just don't think it's right so uh, everyone's looking to try and make that mm. season meaningful yes. this is the best way uh, Nate asks assuming Murata's days at Chelsea are numbered. Uh, do you think he can come back to form when he's transferred? Yes, I do. I think um, I got this one wrong. I thought Morata would be really good for Chelsea. A Six goals in 27 games in 2018. He's clearly not. We talked about earlier in the show about his problems with Hazard and um, Hazard not trusting him. And I do think goes to another league that he could be very, very good. Not physical enough for the Premier League, but still a very, very good player. Has attributes to his game. I think his confidence will come back when he, mm. he leaves to a, a European league again, probably Spain. And so, yes, I'm with you, KJ. I think he will come back to being the striker that we expected. Uh, Daniel Betteridge is looking for a new hipster team to support. Uh, so right now, outside of the, the best teams, outside of the big boys, uh, which team is, is the team to, to look out for? Wow, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> it's a tough question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm obs- I mean, many people know that I love the Spanish league. I love La Liga. Uh, for me, it's a ma- magnificent league. Um, you know, I, I love my Athletic Bilbao, so I'll, I'll maybe go to support Bilbao, <laughs> but right now they're rubbish. So if you want a good team, uh, Sevilla is a team Stephen and I covered a lot yeah. during Europe. They're back again. They're doing great. There's some really good players on that team. Ben Yedda, Ben Yeager. Um, Stephen and I have uh, a little bit of a man crush on Escudero. He's a magnificent left great foot. Great left back. Uh, great left back. So um, I'll say them um, because I don't think, I don't know where you're going to go. So hopefully not this, <laughs> I can't really say Dortmund <laughs> no. because they're a really big team but they are a, yeah. a fun team to watch right now. Yeah, you can't pick a team that have won the, the Champions League in the last 20 years. No, Dortmund are one of the teams top exactly. of the, the Bundesliga. Uh, another team in Spain that are maybe a hipster team, Real Betis, Setien, a coach who's 60 years old, but a lot of attention coming from him, playing some really exciting Barcelona, Pep Guardiola type football. Maybe that's one. I will pick one in the Premier League and there's nothing hipster about Wolverhampton, but I'm going to see them. Good I think shout. under Nuno Santo, they've played some exciting stuff yes they made some great acquisitions uh, you know Portuguese internationals and the likes of Matinho and Rui Patricio but I like the way they play they're very uh, they've got a distinct style so maybe that's one and last one uh, I'd like to announce the contest winner uh, we were on Twitter over the last week asking everyone to use the hashtag ask AFP and if you were the one chosen uh, you would get to have t- two tickets to a CPL game or an MLS game of your choice mm, uh, nice. the 
the the winner is uh, the Weefer. Um, his name is Aaron. He asks, aside from Van Dyke, who are your top four center backs in the Premier League and why? Wow, go ahead, mate. You're you're our, you're <laughs> okay. Our, you're our resident center back, so you can go first. I'll go first. Uh, tight first between one Alderweireld. So I'm going to go for him at Tottenham. Brilliant player. Not a great last few seasons, but is back to scintillating form. Can pass the ball, can defend, reads the game really well. Number two, Americ Laporte, a favourite of KG's. Certainly yep. he's going to be on his list because he's a one. wonderful player. Yep. Uh, great left foot, can take the ball forward, but an outstanding defender. Watch him go from strength to strength at City alongside John Stones, who I am not going to pick in this one, but a player I love. Number three for me is Connor Cody, Wolverhampton. Wonderful player. This season, yeah. This season, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I'm not suggesting he's he's maybe in the class of the other two guys, but I think he's having a great season. I see him potentially getting a caps for England, KJ. Mm-hmm. I do like him in there. I think that his game will grow as he gets even more experience playing that level of football. And number four, Lewis Dunk, playing in a very well set up defensive side, but my kind of centre half, old style, head the ball, kick the ball. It's just basically the modern day version of you. <laughs> Keep the ball out the net. I love him. Uh, Emmerich Laporte is, uh, for me, the best centre back, not called Virgil van Dijk in the Premier League, and it's not close. Uh, a tremendous footballer, as Stephen has said, and I've been a big fan of his for a while. After all, I, I should declare an interest as an aforementioned uh, mention about Athletic Bilbao. So I've watched Laporte for many, many years. Great to see him doing well. Um, Alderweireld as well, for me, right there with him. Um, you know, very, very good player, so I won't talk too much about that. The other two I will go with, Nathan Ake, who I think is going to get a big move um, and will be probably £60, £70 million pounds if Chelsea um, didn't have a buyback in that system. I don't know why, but they, he's, he's a very, very good player. Good left foot, can play left back as well on left side of a back three. And Joe Gomez, um, just a little bit of a nod over John Stones as it continues to evolve and there's going to be uh, a mainstay in the Liverpool and England centre-back partnership for many, many years. A tremendous footballer, Rapid with his pace and um, a great distribution as well. Very calm on the ball and will only get better and better alongside Mr. Van Dyke. Perfect. A uh, final re- reminder to uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, A Football Pod, and use the hashtag AskAFP. Yeah, and please go out there and rate and review the podcast. It's been nothing but a positive reaction since we came out there. We are wrapping up in episode one, Stevie. It's been a pleasure. I've had a blast, mate. It's been brilliant. It's passed really quick. I love talking football with you. And uh, thank everyone for their, their interaction. Again, it's, it's been great. So we hope you listen and we hope you like it. We do. And we will continue, continue to interact with you every week. So continue to do that. A reminder, at hashtag AskAFP. Uh, rate and review the podcast wherever it is your preference. Thanks to Sean. Thanks to Dylan. Thanks to Clay, and we'll speak to you next week.